welcome to Family Addiction Coaching, a podcast about families supporting a loved one with addiction. Each episode will provide insight into a real family's experience, what families find useful and not, what is available in the community, and what would help make their journey easier. Similar to what happens in our coaching service, we'll discuss how families have encouraged their loved one into recovery, as well as their own family recovery. We'll also discuss harm reduction, an especially useful approach for those with no current interest in recovery. I'm your host, Patrick Doyle of Family Addiction Coaching. With a master's degree in social work, I'm licensed by the state of Massachusetts and comply with the strict code of ethics of the National Association of Social Workers. Taking over today's episode of Family Addiction Coaching Podcast are two highly accomplished guest interviewers who are indeed experts in the field of addiction recovery, including harm reduction. Both Sean Fogler and Bill Kinkle are in sustained recovery from serious addiction. Not only do they work in the field, they are also active in many advocacy initiatives. By sharing their personal family experiences, Sean and Bill add so much value to this conversation. You'll want to subscribe to and review their Health Professionals in Recovery podcast on Apple Podcasts and at healthprosinrecovery.com. A big thank you shout out to listener Mitchie Hen, who wrote this review on Family Addiction Coaching Podcasts on Apple Podcasts. Informative and eye-opening podcast. This podcast truly changes up the discussion of addiction. You're hearing the stories of real people affected by those they love, dealing with substance use disorder, and the different ways it manifests person to person. It opens eyes that a person with addiction does not fit into one box, nor does what works for the person and for their loved ones. Patrick provides a safe space for sharing and adds insight while allowing the person to tell the story they want to tell, to speak openly and uninterrupted. It is truly refreshing. Love it. We promise to read your reviews in future episodes. Okay, welcome to Family Addiction Coaching Podcast. My name is Sean Fogler, and we also have Bill Kinkle on the line and Patrick Doyle. I'm not Patrick Doyle, and this is his podcast, but today Bill and I are taking it over. So I'm going to just start with a little bit of introduction about myself. I am a physician in long-term recovery. I practiced anesthesiology for over a decade in the Philadelphia area. I'm also a survivor of the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center and struggled with PTSD. And that, for me, led to a substance use disorder, which set me on quite a journey, but miraculously, with a lot of work and a lot of love and support around me, I found recovery, and one of the things that was critical to my recovery was my family, and and that's something that Patrick focuses on, and that's something that's important to me, and I also think it's something that's really left out of the equation. And so um, that's a little bit about me, and now we have Bill Kinkle. Hi, yeah, and I'm Bill Kinkle, also a person who is in sustained recovery from primarily an opioid use disorder. I was in healthcare for a long time, initially as a paramedic. Then I became a nurse and I worked in an ER. I worked in an ICU for a while. I was a flight paramedic. I had a side career for about five years in ministry where I was working as a a pastoral intern. Uh, But I'm also a father uh, and a husband. I have three small children and I'm married to a wonderful woman. And that's ultimately, that's really how I really became friends with Patrick is that through my journey into recovery, uh, I was astounded at how much my wife and my family were left out of the recovery process. And as I got further into recovery, I started to realize how important they were, that they were a critical aspect. And without them, I would have been dead. That And that's why Patrick and the work that he does in his podcast was so enticing to me because I didn't find anyone out there who understood uh, or believed in the power of family. And that's, that's sort of how we got here. Thank you. I just want to start by thanking you so much for lending your expertise. And I really appreciate it. I couldn't think of a better couple to take over the reins, especially with your background in healthcare, being healthcare professionals, and also having very positive, established, sustained recoveries. So thank you so much for your participation. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure that our audience is going to benefit tremendously from that. 
Well, we, we certainly hope so. Do you mind just telling us a little bit about like what is family addiction coaching and what is it exactly that you do? Great way to start, Bill. Thank you for that. Basically, I use my expertise as a clinical social worker working with families as well as individuals with addiction. And I use those skills to support and help people navigate illness of addiction, find their way to a path to recovery, build stronger family connections, and to help families and individuals get their lives back on track. Many people aren't sure where to turn to or what to do when they learn that a loved one has an addiction. It's pretty consistent. Generally, a person says, I just found out that my husband has some type of substance use disorder. I wasn't aware of it, and I don't know the first thing to do to try to support him. It's a pivotal moment for the family where they are seeing more clearly that there is addiction and they don't have the foggiest idea of what to do, even just to be supportive. And with all the confusing information online these days about different types of treatment, many different options, families need someone to filter the noise. And I help families do this through coaching conducted primarily over the phone, which allows for family meetings. And you can bring maybe even as many as 8, 10, 12 people together on a conference call that if you try to do that in person, it just wouldn't happen. So basically, to filter out the noise of some of the misinformation out there, that's an important function as well. And I help families do this. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's amazing actually, because that was one of the big struggles that we had as a family is that I was in and out of treatment. I mean, for me, it was 16 times over about an 18 month period. So Trish, my wife, that was one of the things with her not having any contact and with the treatment centers, but also no experience with addiction at a personal level. It was really, really difficult for her to, to make sense out of what was going on. She was being bombarded with a lot of information and her being a trained social worker, a lot of it didn't make sense in terms of just empowering the individual. And so I guess one of my questions would be, if you were to have met me and you interacted with Trish, what is it that you would have done to coach her to help her in the process? Basically, Trish would have contacted me and, and said, you know, I'm just realizing how serious my spouse's use of drugs, how problematic it has become. And I just feel compelled to do something to help him stay alive. And I don't have the foggiest way of, of how to approach this. So basically assessing the needs of that client and the family, what is the what does the family want to accomplish? What is their end goal? What are they looking to do? Different families are, have different goals. Are they looking to help the person find a residential program? Do they even need that? Through discussion, we help identify what those needs are. Sometimes it's pretty obvious, and sometimes it's not quite so obvious. So basically, I would have assessed Trisha's needs for how she is coping. Sometimes there could be a benefit in counseling support. If she's suffering with symptoms of depression or anxiety herself, and really fine tuning and honing in on what does what is her need and i could have coached her on how to try to interface with the treatment professionals when you were in the resident programs how to reach out to them as we know most treatment residential treatment program staff are not receptive to family outreach Yet I found that with coaching and guidance, sometimes it makes a difference and sometimes family can be successful in getting some kind of reasonable updates and also having input into the discharge plan. For example, how many times have we heard a family calling in and reporting, my loved one's about to be discharged. I don't know what the plan is. I don't know what the prognosis is. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm not sure that I feel comfortable with them coming home yet. So my guidance and information education can help the family reach out to the facility in a way that is likely to get some results. And as we know, the family needs to feel comfortable. The more comfortable the family can feel upon discharge and as discharge approaches, it's just going to reduce any tension and it's going to lead to a more positive, successful outcome for both the family and the patient. I just had a question about conflict. Just briefly, could you describe, you know, frequently I'm sure families and the individual have different goals. And so how do you, how do you manage that? 
A lot of what we do in the coaching is to build a consensus. I've done many coaching sessions with an individual and, and also the family. And sometimes it's real brass tacks negotiation around financial support. Sometimes the family is providing a certain amount of financial support to the patient, but there's a question the patient might feel that they need more. Uh, the family might be wondering if it's money well spent. And having a neutral and skilled third party such as myself involved in a family meeting can help both parties, if you will, stay on track with that kind of negotiation. And we've been very successful in uh, resolving what have, would have been essentially stalemates where there was an impasse. And oftentimes it is financial. What will the family support? What does the patient feel that they need? So we can resolve an impasse, help them come up with an agreement and move the process forward. There generally are so many emotions involved with active addiction and early recovery that it can be hard not to get stuck upon, say, minor points and for the families and patients to not know how to move forward beyond that. So I'm able to say, guys, I think you're, you're missing the forest for the trees well, would you be happy with this? They say yes. And sometimes it's as little as 10, 15 minutes discussion and everybody's happy and it allows them to move forward. Does that answer your question, Sean? Yes. No, that's that's excellent. It's just amazing to me because supporting the family is, I mean, you're providing these very robust, you know, wraparound services for families that are so critical in the individual's recovery. And we just, we frequently... We don't overlook it. We talk about it, but I'm not sure it gets addressed to the same extent as the individual does. And we know, you know, substance use disorders affect not just the individual, but but everything around them, right? The family and society. And so um, it's it's great. I mean, it's amazing. I think you're providing an, an outstanding and necessary and really critical service. You know, that's a, that's a really critical piece to to solving the, the puzzle for anybody and in a, any family. Sean and Bill, one thing that I want to make sure that we touch upon as well is the whole concept of harm reduction. And it's not uncommon. A lot of the work that I do is trying to help family develop a relationship with a person with problematic substance use, or it might not even be problematic, but the person, the, the identified patient, if you will, is not interested in abstinence or maybe not even in treatment. And the family doesn't know what to deal with that. If they get advice or support from an interventionist, an interventionist would say, you got to let them hit rock bottom and you've got to force them to go to a residential program today across the country. Otherwise, you're not going to talk to them again and you're going to cut off all kind of financial support. You won't let them see the kids, et cetera. That would be the general interventionist approach. The Al Anon approach would be recommending some type of detachment, detachment with love, where basically the family tries to take care of itself and minimizes any contact that they have with that individual. When we approach it from a harm reduction, the families are feeling so much better about that. And I may use the analogy, if your loved one and was refusing all treatment for AIDS, would you turn your back on them? Would you cut off financial support for them? Would you remove their housing? Would you remove their health insurance? Invariably, they said, well, no, of course not. I said, you'd want to love them and spend as much precious time as you, you may have with your loved one, correct? And they say, yes. And that's what we work on. And it, it can be tricky because if someone appears to have a serious illness that could be life-threatening and is not pursuing treatment for it, it can be hard for the family to deal with. So that's a lot of the work that we do. And we teach them how to have a maintain a loving relationship with that person, regardless of what the identified patient chooses to do about using, not using, being in treatment or not being in treatment. And this is something that is totally outside of the scope of the addiction treatment industry. They don't deal with this. If a patient says they have no interest in abstinence, they get discharged to the street before you can blink an eye. And the treatment industry doesn't recognize this. Right. And that's, that's a choice, right? And when you make that choice, then other services need to become available, right? Things that will prevent them from 
you know, acquiring disease or transmitting disease or, you know, things to reduce overdose deaths, you know, like naloxone and having people around, but nobody talks about that. You know, if somebody makes the decision, I'm not ready to quit, it's out, out to the street. And that today, you know, may be a death sentence. Wouldn't you guys agree? I'm sure that you would. There are so many people that are in that space that they're not sure what they want to do about their use. They may want to moderate, they may want to minimize, and they may feel pretty confident that they can do that. There are a lot of people with that mindset. Now, whether we think it's going to likely to be successful or not, we need to meet people where they're at. And we need to embrace that entire population of people who aren't quite sure or think that they can moderate their use. And we cannot be abandoning them. Unfortunately, they're being abandoned. They are. And I, I love the term meeting people where they're, they're at. And I think the treatment industry has started to adopt, you know, that phrase. But it's not just meet people where they're at. It's meet people where they're at as long as you're doing what we think you should be doing or behaving in a way that we deem acceptable. That's not really harm reduction. If you're meeting people where you're, they're at, you're meeting them where they're at, no matter what, right? You're accepting them for who they're, they are, you're accepting their choices, and you're supporting them and, and helping them live as healthy as they possibly can. Absolutely. And, and the key point is there, and I'm sure you'd agree with this, Bill, is that you meet them where they're, they're at, but you don't leave them there. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the whole... I mean, that's really uh, what encompasses har encompasses harm reduction is uh, just the idea of meeting people where they're at, period. Not meeting them where they're at with any other additional expectations, because a lot of times that's what we do. We have this idea on our mind of where we want someone to be, and a lot of times it's unconscious. People will do things thinking that, well, this will help motivate them to get them where I think they should be instead of realizing that they're a human being, they have autonomy, they can make decisions on their own, and... What I want to do in a harm reduction role is empower the individual to work with them to develop a plan of what exactly is it that you would like your life to look like. If you could have the, the most satisfying, most, fu most fulfilling life, what would that look like? And then from there, start to work on very small incremental ways that we could start to move in that direction. And that may be towards a direction of abstinence at some point. It may be towards a direction of moderation. It may be towards a direction of just reducing use so that it, you don't experience negative consequences. I mean, one of the things that was really difficult for me to grasp in the beginning was the fact that most people who use drugs don't use them problematically. Most people can moderate. The percentage that generally present to treatment centers are the very small group that can't moderate and can't manage. I mean, really harm reduction on top of meeting people where they at. For me, it's just about how do we get you to a place where you are happy and content and satisfied in your life and you feel that it has meaning? It's really the big question. And Sean and I talk very often that that's, I think, the biggest problem with addiction treatment, period, is that we're solely focused or prim and primarily focused on the drug because that's the most visible aspect of addiction is drug use and the negative consequences that come out of that. Instead of asking the question, how do we get you to stop using drugs? And we change the question to, what do you think would make you happy in your life? And now the pathway right. and the doors open up to a whole host of different things. It's health and wellness. If you don't have a feeling of being in control of your decisions, that feeling of autonomy and self-determination, you're not going to have much health and wellness at some point. This discussion reminds me, we've had family meetings with a, a mother and an adult son where the adult son was choosing to continue to drink. And the mother was terrified of this because she had seen so many disasters in the past and she thought it was totally unsafe for him to be drinking. However, she wanted to maintain a relationship with him. So we would have family meetings, basically conference calls. Everybody has to agree to it to, for it to work. And basically, if anybody brought up alcohol use, it was going to be only the identified patient. It wasn't going to be me. It wasn't going to be the mother. And... I had to step in and interrupt mom a couple of times, more than once, say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm hearing you ask your son about his drinking. Remember, that's that's not within the scope of these meetings. She goes, oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, it's so hard for me not to ask him about his drinking. I'm worried sick about it, which then leads to a really productive discussion of her concerns and her level of concern. 
and she might start shedding a few tears. That's good information. That's really good communication that you have facilitated in that family that they wouldn't have gotten to that if not for the coaching. So son responds by saying, wow, I had no idea that it upset you this much, that you can't get your mind on anything else. I'm upset that you are hurt by my choices, yet I am glad to hear that, and it gives me a lot to think about. Very, very powerful. Yeah, we totally agree with that. So I guess just quickly, why do you do this, Patrick? I grew up in what you might call a high-stress family and home life. A lot of love, a lot of kids. I'm one of seven. And I think for my parents, that was just a lot of responsibility to raise seven children and both of them working full time. It wasn't easy. And so sometimes, you know, tempers would flare. Ultimately, it was a challenging environment to grow up in. And during adolescence, I experienced depression, basically a feeling of not fitting in socially and finding it hard to fit in with my own skin. Got into counseling as a young adult. Counseling was so helpful for me to gain my health and recovery from depression that it became my, my life's work. And so went to social work school, got my MSW. And as especially as time has gone by, I've been attracted to working with behavioral health, but especially addiction, especially with families. I wish my family had gotten professional help when I was a kid growing up is the bottom line. They didn't. And we suffered as a result. But if it had been available, it could have made a difference in my life and my family's life. And so if I can give something back to help families, that's what I want to do now. Oh, that's really great. And we're, I mean, we're grateful that, that you're going to be doing this. Like I said, I wish I had this. How can people reach you and how can they learn more about what you have to offer if they have more questions? The easiest way is at www.familyaddictioncoach.com. And on my website, there are podcasts, my phone number's there. There's a web request form for online emailing to contact me. And so basically it's uh, familyaddictioncoach.com. Great. Well, Patrick, we really appreciate the opportunity for you having us on your podcast as a guest thank host. You. And so thanks for all the work that you're doing. Thank you guys so much. As I suspected, I knew it would happen. Your background, your experience, and your passion really has added a lot, contributed a lot to the value of this program for my audience, no doubt. Thank you so much. You and too. Have a wonderful Thanks day. Thanks so much. Thanks. Yeah, you too, Patrick. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Family Addiction Coaching. And if you liked what you heard, please subscribe to the show. We'll continue to interview interesting and strong families as long as there is a need for this information in the community. Make sure to visit our website, www.opioidcoaching.com. If you think you might want professional coaching for yourself or your family, Patrick Doyle is available. Have a peaceful day.